Now, if you have not been here the last several weeks, we've been talking basically about how important it is to be intentional about our faith. Being intentional means making a, a conscious effort to grow in your faith versus the alternative, which would be just kind of hoping it happens. Uh, we've talked about how if you want to be physically fit, you want to pick up the habits of physically fit people. And in the same way, if you want to be spiritually fit or grow in your faith, you want to pick up the habits of people throughout history who have found success with certain habits or disciplines that help us to grow in our faith. And so the last several weeks we've been looking at seven spiritual habits. We've looked at prayer and scripture study. We've looked at worship and small group participation. We've looked at financial generosity and also service, helping other people. And so today we're ready for the last one, the seventh one, which is, we call it by a number of names. We can call it witnessing, it being invitational, evangelism. But when we use the word evangelism right away for many of us, we may get uh, this uh, negative feeling in our minds because there's a lot of negative baggage with evangelism. Partially because many people have experienced bad examples of evangelism and not so much the good examples. And so we generally think of that, the negative, pushy style of evangelism, and we think, uh uh. That's not for me. I don't want to do that. I don't want to participate in that. Also, in our culture, generally, it's frowned upon to talk about your faith or to share your faith with others, and we don't want to be pushy. And so we just kind of say, yeah, evangelism's nice, but it's not for me. In fact, we may even think it's important, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're ready to do it. There was a recent statistic in Christianity Today that said that 80% of regular churchgoers believe that evangelism is important, that sharing their faith is important. But 61% of regular churchgoers have not shared their faith in the last six months. So there's a disconnect there. But it's really important that we share our faith. And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, number one is kind of counterintuitive, and that is that it helps you. Sharing your faith helps you. It helps you grow in your faith, just like the other habits we've been talking about. The main idea behind this is that when you, if you're going to share your faith, if you're going to witness to uh, your experience of God, it forces you to articulate your faith. It forces you to verbalize it. And if you have to say it, then that means you're going to have to be somewhat ready. You're going to have to know how it is that God has worked in your life. You have to be able to verbalize that. And that's something that many of us in many churches are not used to doing. We haven't really been trained to do that. We haven't really thought about that very much. Uh, to think to yourself, gee, what would I say if I were to tell someone why I'm a Christian or what that means or, or how God has made a difference in my life? What would I say? So that can help us to grow. Another reason to share the faith is that as Christians, we believe people need Jesus. People need to know that they're loved. People need to know that God loves them. I think of the story of the prodigal son. Uh, Jesus uh, made up this story to make a point to help us to see what God is like. Uh, to see a picture of God that is very different from what many people had thought. And so in the story, of course, a uh, uh, son takes his father's inheritance before he dies and leaves the family and lives on his own. He makes poor choices. He runs out of resources. And then when he's at the end of his rope, then he decides to come back. And he doesn't think that his dad is going to love him anymore or be able to forgive this. And so he thinks he will work as a hired hand, not as a son, right? Because he's not a son anymore. He figures he, he can't be considered a son. But he can work as a hired hand and at least make some money. And so he goes back to his father. You know, he finds out that his father still loves him and that he's willing to forgive him. Probably, in reality, not without some uh, conversations and maybe some kind of consequence, but, but his father is certainly willing to love him and forgive him. This gives us a new image of God. And I have to wonder, though, I know the story is just that, it's a story. But I have to wonder, what would have happened if, if the son had thought that maybe his dad still loved him? Do you think that he would have returned sooner? I wonder. I don't, I don't know, but... 
maybe he wouldn't have waited till he was at the absolute bottom, you know, until he was completely out of resources. Maybe he would have come back sooner if he thought that he maybe wouldn't have been disowned. And you see, we need Jesus. We need to know that we're loved by God because we all sin. You know, we all make mistakes. We all do things that hurt, right? Hurt one another, hurt God, hurt our relationship with God. And when we do those things and that relationship is strained, then for, for some, not everyone, but for some, they feel God can't possibly love me after what I've done. God can't possibly forgive this. I can't even forgive myself. How can God forgive me? And so if we view God that way, then we may be less apt to return to God. But what if they knew that God loved them anyway? What if we knew that God loved them in spite of their sin? Maybe they'd be more apt to return sooner. Maybe they'd be more apt to come back to God and say, yeah, I'm so sorry, only to hear God say, you know what, I'm going to forgive you. And I love you, and you're still my child. See, we all need that. We all need Jesus, not, not only uh, for forgiveness and to know that we're loved, but also to be our guide in life. And, and as Christians, we believe that the best way to live is through Jesus Christ. And so we, we want that for other people. Then the third reason we want to share our faith is because if the church, which is the physical expression of Jesus in our world today, is to continue, then we want to continue to be invitational. We want to continue to share our faith and to share why we believe Jesus Christ is so life transforming. So, okay, well, how do we do it? Okay, we know we should do it, but how do we do it? Because when we think about evangelism, oftentimes we get cold feet. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to not to say. We don't know if we're going to do it too soon, if we're going to do it too late and miss an opportunity. We don't want to push people away. What do we do? Well, I'll put you at ease. I'm not going to tell you that you need to go door to door and talk to strangers. And I'm not going to tell you that you need to go into a crowded place and ask somebody if they died tonight, if they know where they would go. Uh, th that's not evangelism. That's annoying. Okay? So you don't have to do that. Believe it or not, people do not want to have their shopping experiences interrupted to have you sell them your, their religion. So these methods, while they rarely may work for some people who are just in that right moment and they just need one more tiny budge, for the vast majority of people, it's going to push them further away from the faith and they're going to have another reason that they can put in their belt. Another reason why religion is something that they want nothing to do with and uh, push them further away. So, so we don't want to be pushy. We don't want to be, you know, trying to force it on people. So we are, we are not salespeople. We are not trying to sell anything. All right? We are witnesses. So we are witnessing to something. What does a witness in a courtroom do? They don't try to convince you of anything, hopefully. A good witness simply tells you what they've experienced. They say what they saw, what they heard, what they felt uh, from their perspective. And you might have a number of different witnesses who may witness the same event, but they witness it in a different way, and they might describe it differently, or they might see it from a different angle. But we're all witnesses to something that we have experienced. We're not selling anything. The work of, of spiritual growth ultimately happens through the Holy Spirit. We are not trying to sell anything. We are witnessing to what we have experienced. There's a difference. Uh, for instance, let's say uh, you go into a, a J.C. Penny and you're looking for something uh, to purchase. And a salesperson <clears throat> comes to help you. And that can be helpful, but you know that they want, to, they want you to make a purchase. And so there's a certain sense of, uh, okay, thank you, but they, they know you, you want to make a purchase. But if you have a friend who comes to you and says, ah, I was just at that store the other day and they are having a wonderful sale. You know, maybe you heard from someone, oh, they're having a great sale 
and all the businesses on the square in town it pretty soon and, and you want to take advantage of it because I took part in that last year and boy let me tell you I got this and that and that and I just made I just made such a good deal well if you hear about that from a friend their experience you're probably much more likely to go because you're not feeling pushed but you know that they experienced something great and you want to you want to get that too. You want to save some money, right? So you want to get in on those sales during the holiday season. Well, it's the same thing with our faith. We're not trying to sell anything, but we're witnessing to what we have experienced. So, this means there is no script. There is no certain thing you're supposed to say. There, is, there are no answers that you have to have. You know, there are no diagrams that you have to draw. You know, it's just, it's, it's you. It's your story. People can argue with theology. They can argue with all kinds of things, but they cannot argue with your experience. Your story is your story. And you might say, well, gee, Mike, my story isn't really that interesting. <laughs> you know, we have, we've all heard stories from people who've shared their testimonies, and they just have these awesome stories, you know, where they will tell this story about how they were just a complete jerk before they knew Christ. You know, they just they just were rude and they were mean and they did all these horrible things and they had these uh, one crazy experiences. And we love hearing those stories. And then they they experience Christ and their life is transformed in every way. And boy, those are inspiring stories, aren't they? I mean, they really are. And they encourage us because we think, well, if God can. Put that kind of change in that person, maybe it can work in me too. But uh, here's the thing. Those stories are great. But it's okay if you weren't a jerk before. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay if you haven't had a before experience where you made a ton of mistakes or you did this or that. Everybody's story is going to be different. Maybe that is your story. It's wonderful that God has worked in your life. But for those of you that you would say, well, gee, you know, I, I was told about Jesus from before I was even old enough to comprehend Jesus. I've, I've known Jesus as long as I can remember. I, I, I've been uh, loving Jesus, and, and so I, I really, I haven't, you know, I, I've been pretty, pretty straight-laced. Well, that's okay, too, because your story is also important. And your story can also be encouraging to people. See, every story is important. God is giving you your story to share with others. But the thing is, whatever your story is, one thing you want to share is, how has God made a difference in your life? You know, what would your life be like if it wasn't for God? Or what, maybe you can think of a specific instance in your life, two years ago, three years ago, wherever, two months ago, where you have seen God at work in your life. That's a story you can tell. You don't have to tell your whole life story. You can tell about an incident. And that's your story. Now, I will say uh, that evangelism happens best relationally. So that means with people you know, people that you have a relationship with, people that you've invested time in already without having an agenda. Okay? As I've said a couple weeks ago, we live in a culture where if I'm walking downtown and I see somebody I don't know, if I say hi to them, there's about a 50-50 chance they may or may not say hi back. And that's because we live in a culture where you don't even really say hi to people that you don't already have somewhat of a relationship with. And so sometimes if you say hi to someone you don't know, they're not sure what to do, you know? Uh, and so if we live in a culture where you don't say hi to people you don't know, why do we think people are going to be open to hearing about our faith if they don't know us? Again, like I said, in a rare occasion that might work. But in most cases it's going to work better if they already have a relationship of trust with you. And so this means obviously that we want to have relationships with people that are unchurched. They don't go to church. They don't belong to any church. I'm not talking about a Baptist or a Lutheran or a Presbyterian. They're just not in our church. I'm talking about people that don't go to any church. And the problem is that for a lot of churches, the reason why, and this is not the only reason, but one reason why some churches struggle to grow is because we have very few connections with the outside world. We have very few connections, relationships with people who are not church. 
And so there's kind of like that gap there. And there's no lines. There's no lines going out. And so we spend, we want to make sure we don't spend too much time in church. We want to make sure that we don't spend too much time doing church things. Because we can have church family and church friends and church meals and church studies and all these things. And these things are good. But if we just completely envelop our lives in church things then we probably won't have any real relationships with people outside of the church. And so we want to make sure that we still have those lines of connection with people. But the thing is, and this is kind of counterintuitive, but you want to make sure when you form relationships with people outside of the church, you don't do it just so that you can eventually tell them about your faith. Because that's an agenda, right? So you're not interested in them just for the sake of who they are. You're interested in giving your, sharing your faith. And that's noble, right? That's because we care about them. But oftentimes people can sense that. They can sense if you have an agenda. And so we don't want to be investing in people just so that we can share our faith with them. We want to invest in people because we care about people, because we love them, because we, we want to connect with them. We're genuinely interested in them. And so I would like to encourage you to do that. It's hard. It's hard to share your faith uh, with people. And one of the things that we t I talk about also is that with evangelism, you have to have it to share. You have to have a relationship with God. You have to be, you have to, you can only witness to something you've experienced. And so it's interesting that in history, and still today, people share their faith at great risk to their own lives. People have died sharing their faith because this is such good news. But what does it say that we are so hesitant to do the same when really there's not really any real risk for us? And I put myself in that camp too. You know, it's hard. It's hard to share my faith with, with someone. And doing it in church does not count. Okay? It does not count. It's my job, right? Is you know, and, and you're, you know, it's a relatively safe crowd. But to do it with somebody that's outside the church, that's harder. And so it takes courage. But I think that sometimes we just make it more hard than it needs to be. We make it more complicated than it needs to be. And so we get anxiety around it. What am I going to say? What am I going to do? Don't make it so complicated. Just witness to your own experiences. What has God done for you? How have you experienced God? Just witness to your own experience. Think about it like this. If you have good news to share, let's say you go to a really good restaurant. And you just have a really good experience at that restaurant. Great service. Excellent food. You may want to tell a friend about it. You may even invite to go back to the restaurant with them, right? Because you love that restaurant, and you know they're going to love it too. Well, sharing the good news, because gospel literally means good news, is as simple as that. It's not pushy. It's invitational. Come and see. Jesus, when he recruited his disciples, he didn't try to give them an explanation of who he was. He just said, come and see. And at the same time, that's what it is for us. Come and see. Come and see. You know, when was the last time you read a good book and you just had to share it with someone else? Or when was the last time you went to the theater and you saw a good movie? Just a really moving movie. And you, you told your family and you told your friends, yeah, you ought to go see this movie. When was the last time you experienced a love so deep and a joy so profound that you just said, oh, you've got to experience this. That's the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. And so may we seek to be witnesses to what we have experienced, that we may help others and invite them too to experience the love and joy and life-transforming power of Jesus Christ.